Japan, without doubt a personal favourite country of mine. Here is me in Japan. There are so many things unique to Japan that the land could be known for. The land of sushi, the land of video games and anime, the land of... Oh honey toast, I miss you. But instead, it is known as the land of the rising sun, which isn't unique to Japan. So why out of every country in the world where the sun rises is Japan the land of this phenomenon? Because that is quite literally its name. At least to the Japanese, the word Japan is an exonym, which means its name in English is not the same in its native tongue. Another example of this is how we in English call this country Germany, while the natives of this country call it Deutschland. This means the name Japan in Japan is only really used for tourism reasons. So what do the Japanese call Japan? Well they call it this in kanji which can be pronounced in one of two ways, Nippon or Nihon. For the rest of this video I will be using Nihon. These two kanji characters break down to the two syllables of Nihon, Ni and Hon. Ni translates to sun and Hon translates to root or origin, meaning when the two are put together they translate to sun's origin, which the west has adapted to land of the rising sun. Ok so I haven't answered the question yet, I've explained that in kanji Japan's called the land of the rising sun, but not why. Japan gets this name from their neighbours, China. Ancient China for its time was a hugely advanced civilization, pioneering so much while Japan was in its infancy, meaning China and its culture had a huge influence on Japan. In fact the earliest known mention of Japan in history is from the book of Han, a book of Chinese history from 111 CE. In this book we find out the first ever recorded name of Japan, Wa. The origins of this name for Japan remain unclear, but ideas of its origins come from the Chinese character for the name that can imply a variety of things. An early Chinese dictionary defines the character as meaning submissive and obedient. There's even a second etymology of the name meaning dwarf and pygmy. It's safe to say that the Japanese people were not too fond of this name. They even changed the character from what it was to this, which means harmony, peace, balance, which let's face it is much nicer than submissive dwarf. But hey, no offence if you like that. Other names for Japan used internally within the country grew in popularity too, one of these names being Yamato, a name for one Japanese clan that grew in power and eventually became synonymous with the whole country. The coining of the name Nihon however is a credit to the prince regent of Japan, Shotoku. When writing a letter in 607 CE to the Su dynasty, a dynasty in China at the time, he signed it as the son of heaven in the land where the sun rises, to the son of heaven in the land where the sun sets. FYI, son of heaven is a term used for Chinese emperors, so prince Shotoku calling himself this didn't make the Chinese very happy. How the Japanese finally shook off Wa for Nihon however comes from two different stories. Story number one revolves around a Japanese envoy to China in the 7th century disliking the name of the country and changing it. Story number two states that Chinese Empress Wu in the 8th century ordered that the Japanese envoy change their name. Whatever way it got the name out of these two ideas, the reason why Japan is the land of the rising sun is certain. Japan relative to China is in the east. And what else happens in the east? The sun rises making Japan, first to the Chinese and now for the rest of us, the land of the rising sun. It's most likely you know this country as Japan, and so do most other people in the world, yet in Japan, Japan isn't called Japan, it's called Nihon. A while back I made a video about this and teased a follow up video about how the country of Nihon became known as Japan in English, and here's that video now. Sorry it's a tad late. The name Japan comes from a huge mixture of places and it's hard to pinpoint an exact step by step history as how it became known as Japan in English. A good place to start would be with everyone's favourite explorer, Netflix series and swimming pool game, Marco Polo. During his Asian travels in the 13th century, Marco heard of a far off island of immense gold and wealth. This was of course Japan, yet he never actually got there himself, instead only hearing about it through Chinese people he met on his travels, so his impression of Japan may not be dead on. Despite this introduction of Japan to the west, Marco Polo recorded the land's name as Shipangu, which derives from Raibunguro, the Chinese pronunciation for the characters of Kingdom of Japan, though the internet tells me Raibunguro fits more with Country of Japan. Chinese is hard. While Shipangu has some phonetic similarities with Japan, the Mela and Indonesian words Japang, Japang, and Japan are much closer. Portuguese traders encountered these words during the 16th century, which then led to the country's name being recorded in English for the very first time as Japan. This, along with Mr. Polo Shipangu, led to the name we all know today. 
Japan. Of course, none of this is 100% accurate. Japan and its surrounding countries are ancient, with ancient history that we can only guess at at times, and the sad fact is, we are one blue box away from knowing the full truth on questions like this. But nevertheless, this lifts the weight off my shoulders for a video I promised all that time ago. So, say if you came across some Japanese writing, couldn't speak a single bit of Japanese, and only knew the English language. However, you know that it was the name for something and wanted to share that name with your other English speaking friends. How on earth would you figure out what the Japanese writing is saying? Well, the obvious thing to do would be figure out how the Japanese characters sound, transcribe them into English, and job done. Except it would be that easy if we didn't have the beautiful mess that is the Japanese writing system. The Japanese writing system is made up of two types of characters, and one of those writing systems then breaks down into another two systems. Like I said, beautiful mess. The first of these are kanji. Kanji is a logographic writing system, meaning single characters can represent a whole word or phrase. In example, tree in kanji is this, and it even looks like a little tree. This might seem a little alien to English speakers, but we even have logographs within English, like the signs for the world's currencies, or even the and sign. You could even consider emoji a type of logograph. Along with kanji, the Japanese writing system also consists of kana, which is a syllabic writing system, meaning the characters represent sounds like we have here in English. And like I said, there are two different versions of kana, hiragana and katakana. Hiragana, which is the more curved writing system, it's the more traditional writing system in Japan, containing 46 basic characters which can be combined together to make different sounds. The sounds of hiragana are pretty similar to the sounds of the English language, e.g. this hiragana character can be pronounced identically to how we pronounce this character in the Latin script we use, ah. Hiragana can be used to create whole words in Japanese, such as the Japanese word for hello, made up of five hiragana characters, the first one being pronounced like ko, the second one being pronounced like n, and so on with ni, chi, wa. Konnichiwa. Katakana is the writing system made of 46 straighter and stiffer characters, and is used to aid the reading of kanji and help import words from different languages. Like hiragana, each character represents a sound. This is where we get the stereotypical broken English Japanese pronunciation of words, as some of the words in katakana sound something kinda like their native equivalents, e.g. ice cream in Japanese is spelt with katakana and is pronounced aisu klimu. So now we understand how all these characters work and what character is what, we can use something that is known as romanization to transcribe it into English. In language, romanization is the process of taking a language not written in the Latin script and transcribing it into the Latin script. It doesn't mean to put the Japanese writing in a toga and laurel wreath. Different languages can be romanized in different ways, but the process in Japan is known as romaji. There are many types of romaji, but the most popular is known as Hepburn romanization. Romanization is probably exactly what you imagine it to be, using the 26 characters of the Latin alphabet to represent the sounds made in the Japanese writing system. Romaji works for all three writing systems of Japanese because while the characters of Japanese don't line up with the Latin scripts, the sounds of Japanese do, so we can focus more on what the Japanese characters say as opposed to how to say them. And of course, while Romaji can apply to any word in Japanese, I want to stick to transcribing a Japanese name from Japanese to English, because I'm name explain, not word explain yet. And because it'll be more fascinating to work with a word that's completely native in origin to Japan as we've seen that words not native to Japanese go through katakana. So what characters are used for writing names in Japanese? Well it seems there isn't one definitive set of characters that Japanese names are written in, though they seem to normally be written in kanji. As kanji can be pronounced in different ways, more on that later, sometimes parents will transcribe their kids names into hiragana or katakana to help the child understand how to pronounce their own name. I even saw one person mention how they wrote their daughter's name in hiragana as the name looks softer and rounder in those characters. It must be fun having a language where the aesthetic look of a name can be a factor in what you call your child. But the name we're going to use as an example is the name of the creator of Super Mario, The Legend of Zelda, and countless years of childhood happiness. In Japanese, his name looks like this, and is pronounced and spelt in Romaji as Miyamoto Shigeru. However, in English, we would more likely read this name as Shigeru Miyamoto, as in English, the given name comes before the family name. In Japanese culture, however, this is the other way round. The name Shigeru Miyamoto in Japanese is written completely in kanji, and the big issue with kanji is there is a lot of them, like 
a lot. Hiragana and Katakana both have around 46 characters. In Kanji, however, there are literally thousands, so it's unlikely a Japanese person will know every single character of Kanji, and what seems to be unknown is exactly how each character of Kanji has the sound it does associated with it. An example, this single character in his name is pronounced Shigeru. As mentioned earlier, unlike Hiragana and Katakana which represent single sounds, Kanji can represent whole words and phrases. With Shigeru being a popular given name in Japan, it would make sense to have one character in Kanji to represent it. This single character of kanji however can be transcribed into three hiragana characters, representing the sounds of the kanji character, shigeru, helping us to put it into the latin script much easier. So what about the surname Miyamoto? This surname is written in two kanji characters, with the first character being the part of the name that is pronounced as Mia, and the second character being pronounced as Moto. Fans of the channel may have seen this character of kanji before, as it's also part of Japan's native name Nihon, yet in the name Nihon the character is pronounced as Hon, not Moto. This is because Kanji can have multiple pronunciations, with these pronunciations having different names too. Gun pronunciation is the pronunciation of Kanji brought over from Korea, and in Gun the character is pronounced as Hon, like Nihon, and the Kun pronunciation is pronunciation native to Japan, and in Kun this character is pronounced like Moto, like in Miyamoto. With all these different types of characters and the fact that Kanji can be pronounced in different ways with no hint of how to pronounce them in their written form, I'm sure you can imagine that romanization is far from perfect. While it might seem like a great place to start, and I guess it is, you will start to realise that in the grand scheme it isn't going to help you that much. Say if you were in Japan and saw a sign completely written in kanji, sure if you had a good understanding of romaji you can transcribe it into the latin script, that still isn't going to tell you what the word means in English. Basically Japanese is a really difficult language, and while with romaji it can start to help English speakers understand Japanese, with using the latin alphabet in Japanese it's just kind of weird and creepy, like a lot of things in Japan. Only joke in Japan, you're awesome. It's far and few between that I make topical videos, and that's primarily because it's not very often there's big important name related news in the world. Though there's often silly name related news that I enjoy sharing on Twitter, so don't forget to follow me there at NameExplainYT. Twitter plug aside, it seems this week we have been blessed with some rather big name related news, that being the reveal of the new era in Japan will be called, being called the Reiwa era. This got a lot of people talking, and well with me being eternally doomed to talk about names, it seems like a good time to cover this recent name based news here on the channel. So what exactly are these eras of Japan? Well a lot of nations break up their history into eras and periods. Here in the UK we have things like the Victorian era, Tudor period and so on. Though I'm not too sure if these periods are known as that at the time or have retroactively been given those names. We use these terms to cover time and history as a means to study them. Periods of history brought with them certain events and attitudes, meaning when we want to study those times in history, using these names makes it easier to grasp it all. The eras of Japan however seem to be much more formalised, with the concept of formalising Japanese history being established by Emperor Kotoku in 645 AD. They are also known as Gengo slash Nengo. Since then there have been 239 era names, so we definitely won't be covering all these names. The eras of Japan are used for more than just looking back on their history. Many Japanese people still use these eras as their calendar system, though the western calendar has become more popular over time, with some using both calendar systems interchangeably. Many in the country define themselves by the era they were born and raised in. In the same way in the west we have terms like baby boomers and millennials. These era names are also used in other places in Japan too, being seen on official documents, newspapers and coins. New era names in Japan are introduced along with new emperors and this is why we are getting a new era right now, as at the time of writing this video Japan's current emperor, Emperor Akito, is planning on abdicating his throne on the 1st of May 2019, ending his 30 year reign as emperor of Japan, and the first emperor to abdicate in over 200 years of Japanese history. His eldest son, Naruhito, is the current heir apparent and is due to take the throne once his father abdicates. With the change of emperor comes a change of era names, as we have seen being covered in the news recently. The current Japanese era, which is just about to end, well at the time of writing this video, is called the Heisei era, which starts on the 8th of January 1989. A lot of these era names come from classic Chinese texts, and Heisei is no exception. The name Heisei means achieving peace, and comes from passages in two Chinese classics, the Records of Grand Historian and the Book of Documents. This name of achieving peace was chosen due to the turbulent history of the era that preceded it, the Showa era, which included war, financial crisis and the nation under occupation. 
However, as the Heisei era comes to an end, a new name has been decided on. What's interesting is that the new era names are usually only revealed upon the death of the current emperor, but due to Akito abdicating rather than dying, this means that this tradition has gone out the window, with the name being revealed before he's even abdicated. Of course, this new era name is the Reiwa era, and it breaks tradition in more ways than just being revealed before the current emperor is out. As I said, most era names are from Chinese texts. However, this name of the Reiwa is from the Manyoshu, a compilation of Japanese poetry, not from from China. The name was chosen secretly by a panel of experts ranging from Japanese novelists, professors and business figures, with the name being officially revealed to the press and the public on April 1st, 2019. The first character of the name means good slash beautiful, with the second character meaning peace slash harmony, so the name can be translated into English meaning things like good peace or beautiful harmony. Current Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe said that the name was chosen to reflect the start of an era filled with hope, and that the poach compilation in which the name comes from expresses our nation's rich culture, which we should take pride in along with our nation's beautiful nature. However, despite being just days old at the time of writing, the name has already faced issues. Other names were considered too before Reiwa was chosen. Iko meaning vast glory, Banwa meaning perfect harmony, Banho meaning great security, and Koshi meaning great arrival were all in contention but ultimately rejected. Others in the Japanese public have concerns over the first character of Reiwa, which can also mean command and order. It's understandable to see why the public might be hesitant to be living in an era that name means to be commanded or ordered. However, the Japanese government have assured the public that while the kanji character can be read to mean that, in its source material the character means peace slash harmony, and have stated that nobody in the government thinks like that. Yet perhaps most interestingly is the effect that this era name has had in the most unlikely of places, in the world of Australian property. The Real Estate Institute of Western Australia have stated that since the announcement of this new era name, they have had a vast number of visitors coming to their website. Why is this? Well, if you look at the first letters of each part of their name, you will understand why this is the case, hence why so many people have been visiting their website, reiwa.com. is an island nation. In fact, according to Wikipedia, it's the fourth largest island nation by area and the second largest by population. However, Japan isn't just one massive island in the middle of the sea. Japan is actually an archipelago of many islands. In fact, there are 6,852 islands that make up Japan as a whole. So we won't be covering all 6,852 of these islands, but just the main ones that make up Japan. Japan is primarily split over four main islands and a series of smaller islands in the south. However, as well as being split Split geographically by islands, Japan is split up in a more man-made fashion too, being split into eight regions. Now, three of these regions are just the islands as a whole, so the islands and regions share a name. However, Japan's biggest central island is split into five regions, so today let's look into how the islands and regions of Japan's got their name. And also as an added bonus, let's look into how a city in each region got its name too. First off we have Japan's most northern island, Hokkaido, which as I mentioned is also a region unto itself. This is Japan's second largest island too, and from what I could read it has a very northern feel to it, full of mountains and ski resorts and natural beauty in general. Hokkaido's name is very much tied into its history. The island slash region is seen as Japan's least developed area, and it wasn't until the 1800s that people from the rest of Japan started to inhabit and settle there. Before this the island was called Ezo and meant land of barbarians as it was so untamed. However, as it became more inhabited and built up with the settlements and roads, the name Hokkaido was given to the island, and this name means North Sea Road slash circuit, as roads were built on this island in the Northern Sea of Japan. Hokkaido's most populated city is Sapporo, perhaps most well known for the beer that shares its name that originated from the city. It seems that the name of this city comes from the Ainu language of the Ainu people who are native to this part of Japan. It apparently means dry great river in reference to the Toyohira river. We will come back to the island below Hokkaido in a moment, but for now let's look at the island slash region of Shikoku. Shikoku is the smallest of the four main islands of Japan, and from what I read it is a very Buddhist centric island. The island is home to an ancient pilgrimage in which you can walk the island and visit 88 Buddhist temples. In the past, this island was split into four regions slash provinces. These four historic regions were Ara, Tosa, Ayo and Sunuki, and it's because of this why the island is called Shikoku, as the name Shikoku means four regions. Shikoku's largest city is Matsuyama, home to a beautiful old Japanese castle and some of Japan's oldest hot springs. The name of this city apparently means Pine Mountain. I imagine this is because the island and the city's surroundings are very scenic and would have contained mountains and pine trees. 
Very close to Shikoku is the island slash region of Jushu, which is the southernmost main island of Japan. Jushu is the third largest slash second smallest main island of Japan, depending on your outlook on life, and has something of a subtropical climate, including many hot springs and volcanoes. In fact, because of these volcanoes, the island is also known as the Land of Fire. The name of this island is actually somewhat similar to Shikoku's. This island once split into nine ancient provinces, and now this island derives from Japan's word for the number nine, Jū, with the Shū part of the name coming from the Japanese word for provinces, Shū. The island of Jushu is home to the city of Nagasaki, a port city with many sights to behold that became well known for a very unfortunate reason. The name Nagasaki means long cape. Now, I don't think this relates to the kind of capes that superheroes wear, but more the geographical kind of capes. This kind of cape is defined as a very large piece of land that's sticking out into the sea, and from looking at a map of Nagasaki and the general area, calling it a long cape seems to very much fit the bill. South of the four main islands of Japan lie the Ryukyu Islands, which is a large stretch of islands that in turn are broken into smaller groups of islands that stretch from Japan's southernmost tip all the way to Taiwan. I couldn't find too much on this name, though apparently it came from Chinese and means glazed horn dragon, though why it means this I'm not too sure. The biggest of these islands is called Okinawa, and this and the aforementioned island of Jushu are seen as a region of Japan. On the island of Okinawa is the city of Naha. This city supposedly has a very odd naming origin story. The name apparently comes from the word Naba, which was the name for a large mushroom shaped stone in this city that eroded over time, and Naba over time became Naha. It's rather odd and so far I think this is the first city to be named after a stone that I've covered. And I've saved the biggest for last, that being the island of Honshu. This is of course a huge central island in Japan. Not only is it Japan's biggest island, but it's the seventh largest island in the world. The majority of the Japanese population live on this island, and the majority of the classically Japanese things are on this island too, from Mount Fuji to many of Japan's popular cities. If you're visiting Japan, you'll most likely spend a lot of your time on Honshu Island. Though as interesting as Honshu is, its name isn't as interesting. As I stated, Honshu is very much the main island of Japan, and its name means exactly that, main island slash main province. We even see Shu again, meaning province, like we saw the island of Jushu. As Honshu is so big and populated, it means that unlike the rest of the islands that are standalone regions, Honshu is split into five regions, the most northern of these regions being Tohoku. It seems like the island north of it, Tohoku too can get rather chilly in the winter months, though I've read it's full of history and natural beauty. The name Tohoku simply means northeast region, as well by some surprises in the northeast of the island of Honshu. The largest city in the region is called Sendai, and while I could find out it has the nickname of the city of trees due to the many trees in the city, I couldn't find out what the name itself meant. I found out that the kanji characters of this name apparently translate to mean hermit and stand, so I'll let you figure out what that means. And below Tohoku you will find Japan's most populated region, home to about one third of all the Japanese population. This being the region of Kanto, which yes is a name that will sound similar to a lot of you. Kanto contains Japan's capital of Tokyo, so I'm sure you see why it is so populated. Outside of Tokyo however, Kanto can be a very rural region. I read that the name Kanto means east of the border slash barrier, and to explain this name properly, we have to bring in another region of Japan, Kansai, which is also known as Kinki, but YouTube may demonetize us if we use that name. The name Kansai means west of the border slash barrier. These two regions of Kanto and Kansai have a deep intertwined history, primarily because Kanto is home to Tokyo and Kansai is home to Kyoto. Kyoto was the former capital of Japan, but it was moved to Tokyo. This in the past led to quite the split between these two regions, hence why they both thought they were the ends of the land and gained these names, though I imagine that this feud isn't quite as heated these days. Now, as for cities in Kanto and Kansai, as I mentioned, they are home to Japan's two most well-known cities, Tokyo and Kyoto. Kyoto, so you may think I'd explain their names, however I covered their names and their history in way more detail in a video unto itself, so go check that out. Instead, for Kanto I'd like to cover Yokohama, and for Kansai I'd like to cover Osaka. Just outside of Tokyo, 
Yokohama is Japan's second largest city. The name means horizontal beach and relates to the river and the sandbars that used to be there and made the river look like a horizontal beach. Osaka in Kansai is too a huge colourful city. The name means large slash big hill, though the city is actually rather flat. This name probably refers to the nearby hills and nature. Though between Kanto and Kansai we have the region of Shubu. This region contains perhaps Japan's most well known landmark, which can be seen even from Tokyo. Mount Fuji. This region is very central in Japan, so not very creatively, the name simply means it's central region slash central part. While not the biggest city in the region, I'm going to cover the name of Takayama in the region, as I've been there myself and it's a lovely city. This name apparently means high mountain, which makes all the sense in the world as the city is surrounded by high mountains. And finally, at the western tip of Honshu Island, we have the Shugoku region. This region may have the most confusing name of all the regions of Japan, as Shugoku means central country. Now, I understand why Shubu had a name like this, as it is in the centre of Honshu. However, Shugoku is about as far away from the centre of Honshu as it gets, so why it has this name, I'm not too sure. Perhaps it has something to do with the past and previous tribes of people living in the land. To them, this may have been the central area of their land. But to modern ears, that name really doesn't work out. The region of Chugoku is home to the city of Hiroshima, which, like Nagasaki, is famous for a very sad reason too. Like with the name Chugoku, Hiroshima is a bit of an odd name too, as it means wide island, and the city of Hiroshima is not an island, though Hiroshima is also the name for the wider area around the city too, and this wider area does include many islands, some of which are rather wide I imagine, which most likely explains to us where the name Name comes from. And that just about wraps things up here. In the past we've looked into the name of Japan and its native name of Nihon slash Nippon, why it's known as the land of the rising sun, and even why Tokyo and Kyoto have similar names. Now we understand how its main islands, its regions, and some of its most popular cities got their names too. It'd be easy to say we are done with Japan, however these regions and islands of Japan actually break down into 47 different prefectures, each with their own name. I guess they can be saved for another time. Most nations are broken up into smaller areas. These smaller areas are known as administrative divisions slash subnational entities slash country subdivisions, plus many other names, but I personally like country subdivision the most, so let's stick with that. There are many reasons why countries get split up in these ways, though the main reason is for regulating and governing. It's kind of hard to have one person in charge of an entire huge landmass, so it's easy to split up into regions to have local governments that feed into one bigger government. However, these subdivisions can also foster their own image and cultural identity. Sometimes these subdivisions want to become nations of their own because they feel so different to the nations they are a part of. And these subdivisions of course have names, in two ways. Each country has a name for what they call their subdivision, and the subdivisions have unique names unto themselves. The best example of this has to be the USA. As a nation, the USA is a series of states that are united, as the name gives away. So from this, we can gather what their subdivisions are called, states. The USA is made out of 50 of these subdivision states, and all 50 of these states have their own unique unique names like Texas, Kansas, Hawaii, and so on. And yes, one day I will explain these state names, but only when we hit our goal of $1,000 a month on Patreon. So if you want to see that video, consider supporting the channel on Patreon. Even just $1 a month seriously helps out in an amazing way. Patreon plug aside, the USA isn't the only nation to call it subdivision states. Just below the USA is Mexico, which is split into 32 states, Brazil is two made up of states, and Germany over in Europe has states too. Other subdivision names include county, used across the United Kingdom, Ireland and Liberia, province used in the likes of Bulgaria, Pakistan and Canada, region used in Chad, Belgium and Morocco, parish used in Jamaica and Andorra, and even oblast used in the likes of Russia and Ukraine, just to name a few examples. And yes, these different names for different subdivisions do actually mean kind of different things in the way they are governed and such, but that's way out the realm of discussion for today's video, perhaps a different time. As we saw, a lot of these subdivision names are used by multiple countries, like how nations as different as Jamaica and Andorra can both have parishes, though some are a tad more unique to their nations, such as the name for the subdivisions of Japan. Japan have always had an image of doing things in their own unique way, and this image dates back to an era in Japan's history called Sakoku. This period lasted from 1639 to 1853, and during this time, Japan had an incredibly strict foreign policy, meaning no one could enter or leave the nation. Because of this, Japan 
Japan's unique identity blossom and many quintessential Japanese things like kabuki theatre, tea ceremonies and bonsai trees are born from this time period. While in the past we have talked about the islands and regions of Japan, these islands and regions are split into subdivisions and these subdivisions are called prefectures. There's two things I find really interesting about Japan's subdivisions being called prefectures. One being that it's a rather unique name to Japan, although yes other nations do slash did have prefectures like France, Greece, the Central African Republic and Guinea. However, it seems that prefecture is a term most linked with Japan today. And two being that this really isn't a very Japanese name at all. As I said, Japan is a nation that very much do slash did things their own way. And while this seems to be the case most of the time, in no way did prefecture originate from Japan. Prefectures originated in ancient Rome, where emperors would delegate areas of the land to be controlled by a specific person. These specific people were called prefect, which was a rank in Rome but is now more commonly seen as a name for kids given a grain of power and a fancy badge in schools. In Latin, prefectures were called prefectura, so the name prefecture obviously comes from prefect and that ur word forming element added to the end of it. So where did prefects come from? Well that's obviously Latin too, and it comes from the Latin pre, meaning front slash before, where we got the modern pre prefix from and the latin face meaning to make slash do as prefects were placed in front of other people to make decisions and do the work of the emperor so this name makes a lot of sense when you look into its etymology so how did this subdivision name that originated in ancient rome end up being applied to the subdivisions of an island nation all the way over in east asia well here's the next big twist they kind of are and aren't called prefectures in english we call the subdivisions of japan prefectures however in japanese they're called todo Fulken. There's literally no way I can say that about it sounding rude, so let's just carry on. This name is actually a compound noun of sorts. Japan is made up of 47 prefectures, and these 47 are split into four different categories. One is a metropolis prefecture, which in Japanese is called a tor. One is a circuit slash territory prefecture, which in Japanese is called a do. Two are urban prefectures, which in Japanese are called fu. And the other 43 are just standard prefectures, which in Japanese are called ken. So if we take all these short Japanese names for types of prefectures and put them together, Together, we get Todo Fouken, which is where the name comes from. So they're called this in Japanese, but prefectures in English. Why is this the case? Why was prefecture chosen to be their English name as opposed to something more commonplace like state or region or province? Well, this is because the Japanese at Todo Fouken were heavily inspired by the prefectures of Europe, and there's a pretty interesting story as to how this all came about. It all begins around the end of the Tokugawa Shogunate. This shogunate was the central power that united feuding factions in Japan. This shogunate lasted from 1603 all the way up until 1868, so well over 200 years. It was during this shogunate's rule that the aforementioned Sokoku period of isolation took place, lasting from 1639 till 1853. Because of all this, Japan had little to do with other countries, and other countries had little to do with Japan. So foreign nations didn't know a whole lot about Japan, or how it was governed. This is how the Tokawaga shogunate liked things. However, as we mentioned, the rule came to an end in 1853 and in its place came the Meiji Restoration. This is when Japan came back under the rule of an emperor as opposed to a shogunate after 200 plus years, with this emperor being Emperor Meiji. However, he wanted Japan to be more than just under a monarchy. He wanted Japan to become more integrated into the increasingly more intertwined world and his restoration saw the country become more modernised and westernised. One thing in particular the Meiji Restoration was wanted to change was the previous subdivisions of Japan that the Tokugawa shogunate had put in place. They wanted their country, subdivisions included, to be more in line with other nations on the planet. So to find out how other countries got things done, Japanese officials were sent to Europe and the Americas to see how things like education, international relations, business, industry and government were being handled in these parts of the world. And of course, something else these Japanese officials would have studied is how and why nations put their land into subdivisions. One subdivision they found were the states of the USA. However, these states didn't fit what they wanted. This is because the states of the USA have a degree of autonomy, voted in leaders and separated church and state. This drastically opposed the Meiji regime, which was one of divine rule, meaning that the monarch was put there by God and no earthly being could deny it. And they wanted their subdivisions divisions have minimal autonomy, so it's understandable to see why they wouldn't be too fond of things like voting and subdivision autonomy. What the Meiji regime and the Japanese officials did like, however, were the subdivisions of France, which at the time were called Prefecture. These subdivisions that France used very much fit with the ideals that Japan had for their own subdivisions, as they were subdivisions of a leader chosen by the emperor and not elected by the people, and they were also set up by Napoleon. Napoleon was of course an emperor himself, and to the Japanese at this time, he was seen as something of a role model, because he 
actually expanded and modernized France, something Emperor Meiji wanted to do with Japan. Though, as Japan started to interact with more and more nations, another issue started to arise, language. The languages of the West used across Europe and America at the time had been interacting with one another for so long, they could understand and translate one another. And on top of this, a pool of shared words had started to form across these languages that could be used when discussing international affairs. As Japan were late to the party, they didn't have this fortune. They needed to borrow words so they could shape their image in the West. However, this could be seen as something of a positive, as they were pretty much unheard of, they could shape their own image and decide for themselves what words would apply to them. So Japan got to work on finding words that the West could use for them, and for their subdivisions they of course chose prefectures. There was a few reasons to why this name was chosen, first off because they adored Napoleon. As I mentioned, Emperor Napoleon was seen by the Japanese as an architect for modernizing and expanding a nation, which is what Meiji wanted for Japan, and Napoleon applied the ancient Roman term prefecture to his subdivisions, so if Japan wanted to emulate Napoleon as much as possible, then borrowing his subdivision name was a pretty good place to start. Secondly, even before the Meiji Restoration and the Tokugawa Shogunate, the word prefix had already been established in Japan. It was the word used by Portuguese explorers in the 16th century who visited Japan. When these explorers came to Japan in this time, they used the Portuguese word for prefectures, prefeitura, for the fiefdoms they found across Japan, with a fiefdom being an area over which someone exercises control as or in the manner of a feudal lord. So many in the West would have already believed there to be prefectures of sort in Japan, and when the Japanese travelled in the West, they would have seen this term already somewhat applied to their subdivisions. Thirdly, the term prefecture was already in the West's aforementioned pool of words for international affairs, meaning Japan could more easily fit into these already established relationships between nations. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, the concept of a prefecture as a subdivision as opposed to a state or territory much better fit what Japan had in mind. Prefecture as a name strongly implies that it's a small part of a larger area ruled by an emperor. It is also implied that the leaders aren't voted in but chosen, and it carries little to no connotation of being independent or autonomous in any way way, unlike other names such as state and territory. This was also coming at a time when states of the United States started exercising more autonomy and even toyed with becoming independent, something Japan wanted none of its land to do. And so, Prefecture was the name given to the nation's subdivisions, and over the years the West hung on to this name while Japan did what Japan does best and created a name much more unique and well Japanese for the areas, Todofukan. So in a bizarre and unexpected series of events, we have the Romans for creating the term and Napoleon for being such a strong role model to thank for how this weirdly western name ended up being used in the quintessential East Asian country of Japan. And of course, each of these prefectures of Japan have unique names like Gifu, Shiba and Hyogo. I guess the next step would be to explain how all 47 of these individual names came about, but in all honesty I'm exhausted from just explaining why they're called prefectures in the first place. Also, Wikipedia has a page titled list of Japanese prefectural name etymologies, and if I made a video on the subject, it would be little more than just me parroting this list, so go check that out for yourselves. Huh, somehow this video ended up with me plugging Wikipedia, because they need more publicity, I guess. that has a king or queen is called a kingdom, somewhere with a sultan is called a sultaner, and somewhere that, theoretically, allow members of the public to rule is called a republic. So logically, somewhere that has an emperor should be called an empire, right? Well, why don't we have a look on a modern map of our planet and find out? In our modern world, there is just one country left that has a head of state with the title of emperor, that being Japan. So that must mean Japan Japan can be called an empire, right? Well, here's the thing. You know how most countries on our planet have full official titles, like how Germany's full name is the Federal Republic of Germany, or how Mexico's full name is the United Mexican States? Well, it's normally in these full official names where we find titles like Kingdom or Empire, like how Oman is officially called the Sultanate of Oman. If we are to look at the list of official country names directly from the United Nations themselves, we will find that the full official name of Japan is Japan. Yep, 
Japan does not only not have Empire in its official title, but it has no additional names at all. It is simply called Japan. Other countries that have no long official names include Belize, Canada, Hungary, Jamaica, and New Zealand, to name just a handful. None of these other nations have emperors, however, but Japan does. So why does the nation of Japan have an emperor, but not call itself an empire? The first thing we really need to answer, however, is what even is an empire? Well, the word of empire comes from the Latin impere, meaning things like to command. And unsurprisingly, the title of emperor, and empress too of course, also comes from these same roots. This is a very western term, so it's probably worth noting here that while we refer to the head of state of Japan as an emperor, the Japanese term is tenno, which we've translated into meaning heavenly emperor. But this doesn't mean that the term emperor and empire are completely completely absent from Japan. They are used and have been used in the past. Japan has borrowed terminology from the West in the past, like how they use prefecture for their region subdivisions, as we discussed in a previous video. Anyway, while that explains where the name Empire came from and how Japan doesn't really have an emperor per se, that doesn't explain what exactly an empire even is. An empire is basically a large amount of land with different subdivisions controlled by one central figure. This however is very similar to a kingdom. So what's the difference between these two things? Well, it seems to be a question of scale. Empires are by and large much larger than kingdoms. A kingdom tends to be just one area of land like a single country or region that is ruled by a central figure. Empires can contain entire kingdoms within them, like how the British Empire contains within it the United Kingdom, which in term is a kingdom formed of smaller kingdoms, or how the Roman Empire had various client kingdoms within it. A great explanation I found online is by comparing kingdoms and empires to a business. Kings slash queens of a kingdom are like the regional manager in control of one part of it, while emperors slash empresses are like the CEO in control of the whole operation. Though this analogy ignores the fact that a kingdom doesn't have to be part of a larger empire, they can just be their own thing. Though back to Japan, and if you couldn't guess, while Japan might not be called an empire now, once upon a time it most certainly did. And like many empires on our planet, the land that this empire claimed reached out further than just the islands that we now link with Japan. At the empire's peak in 1942, its claim reached far into parts of modern day China, Korea, and a huge chunk of Southeast Asia. This was actually relatively late into the empire of Japan's history however, and emperors in Japan go a long way back. In fact, it goes so far back that the first emperor of Japan is more a legendary figure than a historical person. But with most legends, there must be a grain of truth somewhere within it all. This first emperor was one Emperor Jimu. He was believed to be a direct descendant of the Japanese sun goddess of Amaterasu, and all emperors and empresses since then have all claimed to have direct descendancy to this goddess too. All these emperors and empresses are part of the imperial family of Japan, and traditionally, their family lineage really can be traced from that first ruler of Jimu to the emperor of Japan today, Naruhito. While the throne of Japan dates back to ancient times, in the past it seems like the power of the emperor of Japan was fairly limiting. Back then, they seemed to have been pretty symbolic, however other rulers of Japan still respected them. This however led ancient Japan to having a bit of a power vacuum with no central rule. While the imperial family were around based in Kyoto in the past, Japan was more or less ruled on a settlement by settlement basis by various powerful families and landowners. It was around the 12th century AD that things started to change however, and this was with the introduction of the samurai. These samurai were initially introduced to protect the land and keep order, however their powers soon started to grow, with one particular samurai seizing on the lack of central power in Japan. That being one Tokugawa Ieyasu, he saw the lack of central power in Japan and realised that the samurais and the shoguns, who oversimplified with the heads of the samurais and Tokugawa was one by this time, could easily fill that void simply with military might. This led to the 
Battle of Sekigahara on the 21st of October 1600. Tokugawa Iyasu and his men were victorious and he became the sole ruler of the entirety of Japan. To this day, he is seen as one of the most important figures in unifying Japan. This however commenced the start of a period of Japan's history known as the Tokugawa Shogunate. This is when shoguns and samurais ruled over Japan instead of landowners and noble families. They also based themselves in the city of Edo instead of Kyoto, which later got renamed Tokyo. It's a whole thing. Though the imperial family however still resided in Kyoto at this time. What's interesting is that this new shift in power didn't abolish the monarchy altogether, rather the shogunate allowed the imperial family to carry on doing their thing in the city of Kyoto. They continued their duties and performed their rituals, however this was more for religious purposes as opposed to legislative purposes. The Tokugawa shogunate period of Japan was a deeply important part of their history and it lasted hundreds of years, from 1603 to 1867. Though as important as it was, it never called itself an empire. The concept of an empire in Japan however, would become a lot more solidified in the next phase of Japan's history, that being the Meiji Restoration. By 1867, the shoguns and the samurais were starting to lose the authority they had been holding on to over the last 200 or so years, and there was a growing demand in the land for power to be given back to the imperial family of Japan. The emperor at this time however was one Emperor Meiji, who was actually just a 14 year old kid. Though nevertheless, clans who supported the emperor were able to topple the Tokugawa shogunate in 1867 and the imperial family were once again rulers of Japan. As mentioned, during the Tokugawa shogunate and even prior to it, the imperial family of Japan actually held little power, being seen more as symbolic and religious figureheads. This changed drastically with the Meiji Restoration however. Now the emperor held sovereign power, with his control of the politics and military of Japan being fairly close to absolute. This led to a rapid change and modernization of Japan in its politics, economy and social structure. During the Tokugawa Shogunate, Japan went through a period known as Sakoku, meaning it closed itself off to the rest of the world on the whole. Now however, Japan was open to planet earth and upon realizing many other nations had amassed the large empires, it wanted additional land for itself too. It was in 1868, the year after the start of the Meiji Restoration, that Japan officially dubbed itself the Empire of Japan, as now the emperor was the one calling the shots. Well, his oligarchs and nobles were out to say. As I mentioned, he was a literal child. During the start of the Meiji Restoration, Japan started to claim land beyond its own islands. This includes lands like the Kurawa islands which now belong to Russia, and the Ryukyu islands which is still a part of Japan to this day. Aside from islands however, Japan also lay claims to parts of mainland Asia too. Most noticeably, the entire Korean peninsula was under the rule of the Japanese empire from 1910 to 1945, and the area of Manchuria too in modern northeast China. These land claims didn't go completely uncontested however. It was around this time in Japan's history that they found themselves at war with Russia, who were too trying to build up a larger empire. The Luso japanese war lasted from 1904 to 1905, with the two nations clashing over land, with Japan ultimately coming out the victors. This war is very much seen as a prelude to the First and Second World War and directly related to them, with some even dubbing it World War Z. It was during the Second World War however that the Empire of Japan claimed way more land for their empire. Japan during the Second World War were of course part of the Axis power with the likes of Germany and Italy and Emperor during the Second World War was one Emperor Hirohito. As mentioned, this empire reached its peak in 1942 which was during the midst of the Second World War. It was during this war that Japan claimed places like Taiwan, Laos, Thailand, Singapore and New New Guinea as part of their empire to varying degrees. Though as we know with history on our side, Japan and the Axis powers were not on the victorious side of that war, and like Germany and Italy, Japan had to face consequences of losing this war. One of those consequences being to surrender the land that their empire claimed during the second world war. On top of this, Hirohito had to give up his pretty much absolute power over Japan too. Though Hirohito, unlike his fellow Axis 
religious leaders was not ousted or even killed. He in fact got to maintain on the throne. This was for a variety of reasons, varying from him still being popular in Japan to him staying on the throne being a condition to Japan's withdrawal from the war. If you are interested in this aspect, please go check out this video myself and my AD History Podcast co-host Paul made about the atomic bombing of Japan during the Second World War. It explains all of this in much more detail, and it's a pretty nifty video too. However, with his power and extra land gone, it meant that the emperor was once again just a symbolic role, like it had been for so much of Japan's past. And another condition Japan faced post-war was to stop calling themselves an empire, to remove that part of their name and their history and to leave it in the past. It became known as the State of Japan, or in Japanese, Nihonkoku. This is the closest Japan gets to having a long official name, though as mentioned, officially it is just called Japan. All this left Japan in a very unique position, that being the position of still having an emperor on the throne, but not having an empire to go along with their emperor, hence the lack of empire in their name. This video topic was suggested by Juan Rodriguez Folelo over on my Patreon. Every Wednesday, I put up a video request post over on my Patreon for my awesome patrons to leave video ideas on. I then pick one of those ideas to be turned into a video the following Wednesday. So, if you have a great idea for a name explain video and wish to enjoy name explain videos ad free as well as get exclusive content, then why not support the channel on Patreon? It takes just $1 a month to help the channel in a huge way and gets you all of these amazing benefits. Visit patreon.com forward slash name explain or click the link down below. Name Explained depends on viewers like yourself supporting the channel financially on Patreon, so a huge thank you to everyone who does. Donating just $1 a month helps the channel amazingly and gets you bonuses including ad-free videos, exclusive content and the power to request ideas to be made into actual Name Explained videos. $2 a month gets you all that plus your name here with all these awesome people. Visit patreon.com forward slash Name Explain or click the link down below to find out how you too can support the channel. Thank you. Thanks for reaching the end of the video. Why not watch another and subscribe to keep up to date on all things Name Explain? You can find myself on Instagram where I'm Name Explain YT and join the Facebook group Friends of Name Explain to talk with myself and other name nerds. All that will be linked down below. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video and once again, thank you all so much.